it's a, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Shai Manor here uh, at the ORI seminar. Uh, Shai is a professor of electrical engineering at the Technion, and he's doing a lot of really exciting stuff now. He's heading uh, this new joint Intel Technion Center for Artificial Intelligence. He's also leading uh, a new research and development initiative by Ford uh, on autonomous driving. And of course, being a uh, leading uh, uh, notable researcher in reinforcement learning and in machine learning, he uh, he has won numerous awards, uh, including several best paper awards, Henry Tao Prize, uh, an ERC starting grant, an HP faculty award. Uh, he's also a Cholev fellow. Uh, and I think this is just a subset of all the various awards. And so it's really exciting that he's here today and he's uh, going to tell us about risk and robustness and reinforcement learning. Uh, thanks, Nathan. Just correction, I, I moved from Ford to NVIDIA, so now I'm uh, with the green machine. Um, uh, so uh, today I'm going to tell you about risk and robustness in uh, RL. So and this is really a, um, a research that has been going on for almost a decade now in my lab. And um, I'm going to give you sort of not just uh, why we're working on risk and robustness, but also what our, uh, is my view at least on uh, reinforcement learning and what is going on in this field and what are the important uh, uh, open questions? Uh, so, um, uh, so RL is really all about uh, sequential decision-making and we'll have uh, three running examples throughout uh, this talk. So the first one is Tetris. This is uh, uh, the game that I think you've all played. You need to clean up. Uh, Shai, uh, just FYI, we can't see your screen right now. Maybe, maybe it's just me, but I can't see your screen. I can. I, I yeah, can. Sorry, yeah, it I was can. just me. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, it works. Sorry, please go on, sorry, apologies. No worries. Uh, so, uh, um, and then the, there is another example is uh, is American an American option. So this is a put option. Uh, there is a, a strike price uh, a K, and whenever the price is above it, you're going to make money, and otherwise you're not you're not going to make money. And uh, the maturity date is is T. So this is a, a sequential stopping uh, decision problem. And more for the on the robotic side, there is a, a pinball domain. So in pinball, pinball you want to, to move your blue ball to the red target and you can go from the top or you can go from the bottom, uh, but everything keeps shaking. So this is like uh, everything keeps going on like this. So you have to, uh, you have to control uh, the pinball. It can be uh, quite uh, a difficult, uh, a difficult task. Uh, so those are the examples for sequential decision problems that we'll, uh, we'll uh, play with uh, uh, today. Uh, so the model that uh, we're going to talk about today, the classical MVP model. So we have a, uh, um, a controlling agent, which is uh, really uh, us. There is, a, there is an, a controlled entity that we're trying to control. You observe some indication of the state, um, maybe the state itself, maybe some observation thereof. And we get a reinforcement signal, we'll call the reward. Uh, as a result, the, the, the agent is doing some action and then something happens to the control ent entity. And this is a very uh, abstract, of course, uh, model for uh, uh, MDPs. So this is a sort of the classical model. Uh, state is a state space. Uh, P the transition probability of the controlled entity. R R the reward, and uh, and A is the, the action space. So today we'll assume that uh, states uh, are given. So uh, the states of the control entity are known. The actions are also known. So the problem is sort of uh, easy. I see that there is a new fan there, uh, Nathan. Uh, the trans transition dynamics and uh, and the reward are not known. So uh, this is sort of the classical RL uh, setting. When you know what you can do, you know what you can observe, but you don't know what is the effect of your actions, and you don't know exactly how, how much are you going to get. And the classical objective that has been uh, studied, uh, I think, for uh, over 60 years now is uh, uh, the, the, the expected discounted return. So this is basically you want to find the policy pi, that maximize your expected uh, uh, cumulative discounted return. Um, and just uh, my, one of my favorite quotes uh, that, you know, we know that this is a model, we know it's not correct, but we hope that it's, uh, it's somewhat uh, uh, useful. Uh, so just what happened in the last uh, few years. In the last few years, uh, we saw lots of RL algorithms. And this is a, a sort of a brief ontology of those algorithms. You have uh, uh, model-free RL, model-based RL. So in model-based, we try to either learn the model or we assume that the model is given. In model-free, we're trying to uh, uh, simulate. So uh, we either, we're trying to either optimize the policy or optimize something else called uh, the Q function, uh, which is going to give us a policy. So there are lots of algorithms, and each of those algorithms here uh, probably deserves a, a talk uh, on its own. 
Um, so we have many algorithms, but we only have very few uh, real-world successes. So whenever there is a real-world success, then the whole community touts uh, and, 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 and shouts uh, uh, yay, but, but this is uh, still a, a fairly, uh, fairly a, rare, a rare occasion. So it happens once every three or four months. And, uh, and the question is really why? So, uh, and then this talk, uh, I'm going to try and give you an answer uh, why and how this could be remedied. Uh, so let me start with uh, uh, one of the reasons, which is psychological. So I'm just going to give you one slide about it. And this is uh, an example for a reductionist uh, uh, fallacy. So let's, ag let's agree on the, fo on the following uh, uh, three sentences. So let's agree that only smart people can play Go well. Um, this is a very, very hard game to play well. Uh, let's agree that almost everybody can tell a joke. And let's agree that computers are really good in, in Go. So that's, that, I think, is something that we can all uh, agree on. Um, so, so a logical potential conclusion is that computers can easily tell a joke. Now, I don't know if you ever heard a computer tell a joke. It's not very funny. So, so, so some, uh, some activities that are very easy for humans uh, uh, can be assumed to be also easy for uh, computers. And that's just a, a fallacy. And a good example is, is that in, in, for that is in, in, uh, in action planning and, and movement where humans can move fluently, perhaps uh, the result of uh, uh, some, uh, some, some bil a billion year of evolution, but, um, uh, but uh, for computers this is still, and robots, it's still very hard. And there is a really nice uh, introduction to this uh, con concept of, uh, of uh, uh, false, uh, reductionist fallacies, where we're trying to over oversimplify uh, some problems. And if you have, uh, if you have the time uh, during these COVID years, uh, then you might want to, uh, uh, to read it. Uh, so uh, some people want to do uh, whatever humans can do. So whether you grew up wanting uh, to do uh, uh, term the Terminator, uh, Agent Smith, or Commander Data, um, by and large, when you use machine learning uh, or reinforcement learning in terms of robotics, uh, this is a state of the art. So this is... Um, so this is... This is uh, what humanity knows how to do. Okay. This is uh, when, uh, when Boston Dynamics posted, posted their, uh, uh, the, the, the recent uh, movie, which I, I'm sure all of you have seen, but the robots that are dancing to the music in a perfectly choreographed uh, uh, scene. Uh, this took them a year and a half to compose. Uh, and everything there was you know, perfectly uh, designed, year and a half of several engineers. So, so basically, uh, we're pretty bad in doing, uh, and, and even we're not we're not even close to anything that is remotely like the above uh, uh, robots. We're very far from AGI. Um, and then I would like to sort of uh, um, explain my view a little bit. So there are really three types of uh, of problems in RL. There are the static problems, and the static problem, uh, it's basically no there are no other agents. Uh, you just want to solve a planning problem yourself. It can be very difficult. But it's it's just a planning problem. So this is a, a, akin to driving in, in the road when there are nobody else there. So if you want to get from point A to point B uh, on, on the road, it's not a very difficult uh, uh, problem. And in the example of Pac-Man here, so imagine Pac-Man with no ghosts. So just Pac-Man needs to sort of find a way to cover, maybe solve this Hamiltonian problem. Uh, Pac-Man is trying to, uh, uh, to 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 get as quick to eat as, as much as possible as quickly as possible. Those are, those are static problems. In dynamic problems, there are other agents and that uh, we have to uh, take into consideration. So there, are, there is, in the case of driving, there are other drivers, but they don't see us. We are like ghosts uh, to them. So we have to take into account the existence of other agents, but not the way, uh, the, the, the behavior of other agents uh, uh, or the, the, their reaction to us. And in the case of Pac-Man, this is Pac-Man with the ghost, but the ghosts do not see Pac-Man. They just move around. Uh, like that uh, without reacting to Pac-Man. So this is a problem that we probably know how to solve pretty well. Maybe not perfectly so. But then the most interesting problem is the counterfactual problem. In counterfactual problem, other agents react to what we do. And so this is like driving on the real road where other drivers are going to react to you. In the case of Pac-Man, where the ghost and Pac-Man interact uh, with each other. Um, and and, and that, that's really the type of our problem that we need to solve for any meaningful uh, real-world uh, application. Um, you know, this is a problem I've been working on for the last uh, uh, three years, uh, RL is driving. Just to give you an idea how complex it is, that uh, it's not even clear what is the reward. Uh, um, 
whether it's money, time, energy, uh, it's obvious that killing someone is bad and getting to, your, to, uh, uh, to a place as quickly as possible is good, but then uh, how, I mean, weighing the different uh, types of, uh, of, of, uh, of objectives is something that is quite difficult and also varies from person to person and, uh, and within a person. Uh, in terms of state of observation, this is not, it's, it's pretty difficult to understand what I can do uh, because uh, eventually in, in driving, there are, uh, the outputs are very simple. I mean, there is the steering wheel, there is gas, and there is, there is a brake, and maybe there are some signals, but that's about it. Uh, but if you think about in the granularity of, uh, of hitting the brakes or uh, hitting the, uh, the acceleration uh, appell, then uh, you're probably not going to go very far. Uh, so you need to think about in much more abstract uh, terms uh, uh, rather than um, uh, atomic uh, atomic uh, actions. You need to think about what I can observe, uh, what are the entities, and just uh, to, when, once you try to solve a, a, a real RL problem like uh, like driving, uh, it becomes a uh, pretty nasty. So, uh, so the way I think about problem that I don't think about artificial intelligence. I think that's um, uh, an oversold uh, term at this point in time. Think about what I call extend intelligence. So in, 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 in my view, uh, almost all interesting problems, the controlling agent is not going to be standalone. So there will be another agent, whether human or not, it is going to extend the controlling agent. And the, what is really important is the interaction between this controlling agent and the extending agent. Also, this is like the real core uh, problem here is how to communicate uh, between the, uh, the, the extending agent and the controlling agent and how to how the controlling agents work in a robust, complex uh, system. In the case of the car, it's not enough to be able to get you from point A to point B. It has to be safe. It has to be perceived as uh, safe uh, as well. And those are uh, uh, complex, uh, complex issues. So, uh, um, and before I get to uh, to the math part of today's uh, talk, uh, I wanted to mention the, the principles of uh, of AI. So, so there are really five principles that I think are. Are, I mean, this is what research should be about. Uh, so research should be about uh, what's written here. Uh, so awareness means that we know how well uh, the system performs. It, it, can, it can sort of audit itself. It knows uh, uh, what is happening to it. Um, accountability means that it can explain uh, its actions. It can reason by your words, by example, or by any other interpretable means. So it can justify what it did. Uh, adaptivity means that uh, uh, you need to function properly under a variety of conditions. Uh, maybe some are expected, some are less expected. And, and then the uh, life cycle consciousness, which is something that uh, I think for us as a, I don't know, for OR person uh, uh, or machine learning person is a little bit difficult uh, to, uh, to understand it's how important it is, but, but it really is the key issue that you need to be able to debug and decompose a system. And currently black box systems are just uh, uh, imp it's impossible to debug a black box system. It's very difficult. Uh, it's not even clear. Uh, uh, there are no tools uh, for doing that. And last but not least, scalability with, uh, with resources. So those are the five principles. And whenever I want to judge a research project or a research endeavor, I judge them according to how, how much they contribute to uh, each of those five uh, principles. And to, in today and the rest of this talk, uh, in the more mathy part, I'm going to talk about uh, risk and sensitivity, risk sensitivity and robustness. And those are really about scalability, uh, adaptivity, and accountability. To a lesser extent, uh, uh, to an almost no extent about life cycle, and uh, to some extent about uh, awareness. So, so basically, uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, this whole research direction uh, comes from uh, uh, wanting to do, to have uh, aware and adaptive uh, uh, systems. So uh, from now on, I'm going to focus on this particular aspect or facet of the research, which, which I think is, uh, is, quite, uh, is quite interesting. So uh, let's, uh, uh, let's um, um, uh, talk about uh, why we should be risk sensitive. So here we have an ex the pink ball example that we mentioned before. So you want to get uh, uh, the blue uh, ball to the red uh, target. And there are two uh, pro uh, options for you. You can go from the upper tunnel or from the lower tunnel. For the upper tunnel, uh, the, the probability here is a uh, probability of the function of time, and you see the um, the red uh, curve is basically it will take you longer on average, but it will you get you'll get there with much higher probability. 
Well, if you go from below, then it will take you sometimes shorter time duration, sometimes a longer duration. You just hit, you can hit the one of the walls here, and that's going to take uh, a bit, uh, a bit longer. So basically, in this case, risk sensitivity or risk awareness is going to get you to uh, robust policies. Uh, so the image that you have should have in mind is that I'm, I'm going to try and and and, and protect against a, a very lengthy, uh, very, very lengthy, um, um, in, very lengthy intervals here, uh, uh, and then I'm going to get something which is appears to be more uh, more robust. Okay, so so there are in terms of uncertainty, there are really three types of uncertainties that uh, that we can consider. Um, there is what's what's known as parameter uncertainty. Uh, that's uncertainty the MDP parameters uh, themselves. So transition to, uh, and the rewards. And the objective here is uh, what's known as the robust uh, optimizational objective. You want to look for the best policy under the worst uh, possible parameter in some given set of the expected discount to return. And that's a sort of a classical, uh, a classical objective that has been studied at length in, uh, in robust uh, uh, optimization. Uh, and then there, are, there is an inherent uncertainty, uh, which uh, um, consider the, the stochasticity of the community reward, uh, because expectation is something is some, is sometimes uh, cheating. So if I'll, I'll offer this bet uh, to you, I think uh, whether to choose policy one, policy two, then policy one, policy two, are probably uh, I'm expectation are the same, so I'm sure everybody here would enjoy uh, a game of uh, a game of poker for uh, say a dollar, thousand uh, dollars. I'm not so sure. For a million dollars, I would imagine most of the audience here would, would not be happy to play uh, uh, for that. So so basically, uh, this the inherent uncertainty, the expectation is just not enough. So um, what you could do is you can look at, try to optimize some other risk measure. Uh, for example, you can look at, uh, instead of expectation here, we replaced it by, by uh, uh, a gen general risk measure. For example, this is the Markowitz risk measure. Uh, but you can also think about other uh, uh, risk measures uh, that, uh, uh, and we'll consider one of them. And then the, the, the most interesting risk uh, type of uncertainty, though, is uh, what's known as mole uncertainty. So the mole itself may not be known. So Q we we'll look at, uh, at the at the best uh, uh, policy against uh, the worst uh, the worst model. So it's not just a worst parameter of, of the model that I know, but a class, a whole class uh, of model of models. And then there is uh, um, um, the, the, the the option that my policy is not matched to the model, so there can be a, an exclusive model mismatch. Uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, uh, and 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 largely largely understudied um, type of concern. So uh, when should you care about uh, risk sens uh, sensitivity? You should care about it when uh, uh, the cost of failure is high. For example, uh, the examples are here. So if you, I mean, you're not from Texas, but if you were from Texas, you would care about smart grids now quite a bit. Um, uh, and of course, the model is never known. So we never know a model that uh, is derived from data um, uh, exactly. And as I said before, uh, from the, from the, uh, from the five principles, I care mostly about your scalability. So I look for algorithms that can ex be extended uh, to large, very large state spaces. Uh, adaptivity, that's uh, sort of the risk sensitivity aspect. And accountability, meaning I want to be able to explain why I did what I did in terms of risk. For example, I want to be able to say that I protected against uh, some, uh, uh, some form of, uh, of risk. Okay. So before we continue, uh, what about computational complexity at this point? Uh, so I'm not going to talk about complexity beyond this slide. Everything is very hard. So everything that you want to do here exactly is going to be um, at best uh, at best uh, NP hard. So uh, and at worst, it's not. Some of the problems are not even computable. Uh, so let's forget about exact uh, uh, solutions. Okay. So I'm going to start with uh, uh, some work that we've done for uh, robust MDPs with uh, function approximation. Uh, and, and I'm going to show you the, the, the underlying uh, principle that is, uh, is working here. So let's start with the model. So uh, uh, you, this is uh, the classical MDP model. So you start at state S0, uh, and then with uh, some conditional probability, you transition to S1, to S2, and S3. Uh, so that's a classical planning problem. Uh, in our case, so everything is known. We, there is no no real learning involved, um, uh, but uh, we have no uh, we don't have clarity on the uh, on the transitions. 
maybe they come from confidence intervals or maybe there is a sim simulator involved or, or, or something like that. Uh, and, and we've shown in the past that uh, there is potentially a very large impact uh, for, for those problems. Uh, uh, both us and others have shown it from in, in different uh, in, di for in different applications. So let, let's be a little bit more precise here. So we have uh, what's known as a robust MVP. Uh, state and actions and rewards are as before, uh, but transitions now belong to some uncertainty set, which is written here as, as a script P. Think about it as a con nice convex set. Uh, the, the, the shape of the set is not a problem. Uh, you have a policy, a policy pi, and you look at the worst case objective. So the best policy under the worst model of this expected uh, uh, discounted return. And if, if you like, you can think about it as a game against nature. So uh, one player chooses a policy pi, and then nature chooses a uh, potentially adversarial uh, transition uh, uh, probability. Okay, so what is happening here? We have uh, um, the, um, what's known as a robust value function. For, so for a given policy pi, we look at the uh, worst possible uh, parameter of the expected return. And to understand how something like that will happen, then let's suppose that from status zero, uh, now instead of just having the transitions to move to S1, S2, and S3, uh, there is, uh, say, a confidence interval around the tra uh, this, uh, transition of moving to S1, S2, and S3. And then let's suppose that they move to S3, then there is another transition, conditional transition to move to, say, S2, S4, and S5, but it's, again, it's not perfectly specified. So uh, there are there is a confidence around those uh, those transitions, and and whenever I'm going to sample, I have to take into account that somebody is going to choose, or nature, if you wish, uh, is going to choose the worst possible transitions uh, against uh, against me. So uh, 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 this leads to uh, uh, the robust development equation equ equation for a fixed policy. So this is a um, um, a set of equations. Um, so v pi of of s equals the the, the immediate reward plus the discount fact uh, uh, factors mm -hmm. times the worst uh, possible transition um, uh, in my set uh, uh, times the uh, expected next state uh, uh, next state return. So, so this is a nonlinear uh, Bellman equation. Uh, it's still uh, a, a, a Bellman a con um, a contraction operator. It's governed by a contraction operator. So for small problems, you can show that it's solved. And then uh, under some uh, rectangularity assumption, which means that the set P uh, can be divided into uh, a product set, so P of S uh, of uh, the the the, 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 the set of uncertain transitions uh, can be written as a product in all different states. Uh, then uh, basically the problem can be solved. Uh, but then for large problems, uh, you need to solve a very large nonlinear uh, contraction-based uh, problem, and it's not clear how uh, how how can how that can be done. So so the, the natural approach would be to say let's. Let's look at the function approximation. So uh, you can look at the state uh, dependent uh, features, say in this case, uh, phi of s. And then it's a linear function approximation. So we, we believe that the value function can be written in the function of the features time uh, some uh, parameter vector w, which we try to, figure, to find out. So how do you solve this uh, problem in the, in the standard case? So in a standard case, you just write the v pi of s, so the value of s. Um, equals the expectation of the discounted return. So I can now sample uh, one trajectory from uh, starting in S and then sample another trajectory, another trajectory. I'm going to solve many trajectories for many S's, and I can do a simple regression for W. So I can basically uh, now solve it as a as a linear regression problem. Uh, I'm going to write uh, uh, the, instead of v of v pi of S, I'm going to uh, look at the linear function approximation. And uh, and off I go. So um, and I can you can solve it with your favorite uh, regression uh, uh, algorithm. So the, the the classical case is I think well understood, but but now um, there is a problem for the robust case. So for the robust case, I don't have expectation here, but rather the the worst case model uh, or worst case parameters of the expectation. But I cannot regress now because I don't know how to sample. I don't. There is no, there is no way for me to sample uh, from the worst case model because I don't know what it is. Solving the worst case model seems to be as difficult as a difficult problem as finding W itself. So I I really cannot use uh, my my, my um, uh, the sampling based approaches at least not uh, uh, not naively. But but not all is lost. 
So uh, um, um, the idea that you can uh, uh, that, that you can use here is to, to bootstrap. So the bootstrap is a, an age-old idea in statistics, and basically um, it works in a very simple way. So we have here uh, uh, we start from some initial weights w zero. That's going to be our value function, initial value function estimate, and then we sample n states, and it should be a fairly large number. And then at every iteration we generate a regression targets in, in the following way. So we say, let's suppose that our previous estimate was correct. So our previous estimate, uh, which initially may be bad, but let's suppose that we reach a, a, a point in time where, where it's pretty good. So this is our, our previous uh, estimate. And now, given that this is a, our previous estimate, solving this uh, worst case, pro worst case uh, problem is easy because this is given to us. So this is like solving a, a regular um, a regular uh, minimization uh, uh, problem. So we're going to look at the worst possible uh, model for this uh, particular uh, xi. And now we're going to generate samples uh, yi, and we can just uh, solve a regression problem using your favorite regression algorithm, say least squares uh, algorithm. Uh, so once you do that, then uh, uh, you can uh, iteratively uh, keep on uh, um, finding weights and, and, and you do that based on, on pretending to believe that your previous weights uh, vector was, uh, uh, was correct. So what you can show uh, that perhaps surprisingly uh, you get convergence and you get error bounds. And then uh, um, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, make, the, you can derive, uh, um, you can iterate, iterate between policy evaluation and policy improvement. And then you can even do uh, deep Q learning here. And basically you get error bounds to follow through. So by and large, uh, the problem of, uh, of uh, uh, robust value estimation uh, and later on robust policy uh, optimization is solved uh, because of this bootstrapping uh, trick. Um, let me show you an experiment which I think is, uh, is pretty cool. I don't know how to explain uh, the results here. So if somebody wants to help me, that, that would be good. Um, um, so this is uh, the, the, the option that uh, we saw before. There is a, a given strike price k uh, and, the, and maturity time t. Whenever the price is above k, we can, uh, we can extract profit. If the price is below k, we're going to, I mean, we're not going to lose, but we're going to get zero. And our, our ultimate objective here is to be able to, uh, um, uh, to price uh, the option. But uh, the question for being able to price the op option is, is to find the best policy. And the best the question, the other question is when to execute. So, there is no point in executing here because you're not going to make money. But now when, when the option just starts going above, above K, should we execute uh, or not? So we can execute here, but then we can also wait uh, and then it's going to go down and then we can panic and so forth. So, so basically the question is, when should you, when should you uh, uh, execute? Um, so this is, a, this is a problem, of course, of, of, of great importance. Um, and um, um, there are several formulations uh, uh, from finance uh, here. Uh, let's suppose that we have an, an MDP formulation and you have a, a, um, um, a model that uh, uh, you try to estimate your prices of, in the MDP from, uh, from histor historical data. Um, so when you think about, I mean, this estimate is going to be not that, that good because of course the data is the data from more than a, uh, a year ago is, is probably stale data. Uh, I mean, you don't have a lot of data and you want to consider uh, your estimation uh, uncertainty. So in this, uh, we were in a series of uh, simulations. So uh, we had, a, a, the one, in one of them, we had a, a, a fairly complicated transition model that uh, depends on, 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 on it was the mean reverting uh, uh, model. I can provide details uh, later if someone is interested. Uh, but the estimated model were a very simple constant transition model that only depend on the price. So not the mean reverting, but a very rather uh, a simple model. And, and the, the point is that there is a mismatch in the model class. So we looked at a, a simplified model, but uh, uh, at the robust value uh, of it. So, uh, and this is uh, also the results here. So here we see the graph. Uh, that uh, probability that the return is more than A. And we never lose. This is an, uh, an, an option. So. At worst, the option is not is just not, not going to give us any money, and this is the probability of making more than uh, more than a. And what we see here that if you try to build a nominal model, then your performance are you know I mean not as good and then completely dominated by the robust model. 
And, and what's, what is interesting here is that the nominal model was used for the true model. And the robust model was used for the simplified model. So what we see here uh, is, is an instance of uh, not just uh, being, I mean, we, we, we only aimed for in, in the formulation uh, for uh, in what we call inherent robustness. So for two parameter robustness, sorry. So for, uh, to robustness is the parameter uh, uh, uncertainty. But what we got is uh, model robustness. We got uh, robustness to the actual model that it is not was not taken from the right class, and that's a phenomenon which I said I, I don't I don't have full uh, understanding of it. Just intuitive, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, avenue for research. Uh, so I'm going to now move to a, a somewhat different uh, uh, type of robustness. So that uh, now would be a good time to ask questions uh, if you have any. Okay, just can I see a sign of life? Yeah, uh, sure. This, uh, this is Jim. Uh, Hi, Jim. So, uh, in your this uh, uh, American option model, did you use also the linear function approximation somewhere? Um, yes. Yeah, so this is a, the, the, the 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 there was a usage of linear function approximation. It's a fairly complex. Uh, uh, I mean, the the model itself is fairly complex. Yes, but uh, the right in your your solution, robust solution, you rely on rely on that iteration that the, the functional approximation going on, right? So which class? I mean, is this a, it's a lot of domain knowledge needed, or something that quite uh, standard? I mean, something brute force, maybe neural network, or something? Which which class model of function you use? So uh, I mean, as as far as I recall, the model itself was not. We didn't have to use. Uh, of the, I mean, the issue is that the number of parameters that you want to optimize are not that large. So you want to, uh, to basically get, a, if you get fewer parameters, you get a better uh, uh, model. So the true model was a, a price, uh, um, uh, well, the model that uh, where the transitions depend on, on the price and, and on the trend. And, and, the, and the, the model that we learned uh, was the model that were, were the transitions only depend on the price and not on the trend. Okay, so the I see. So the mod. Okay, so this is different from the your robust uh, that value iteration procedure, right? This example is a. It's not exactly using that, right? It's a, it's, it's not exactly yeah. like showing yeah. the phenomena. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for clarification. Sure. Uh, are there any other questions? questions? Yeah. Sure. Um, I was wondering. Like in the previous example, so an alternate policy would be to. Sorry, there's an echo. I think Jim, your mic is on. Um, so one other policy would be to have like a uninformative prior over the class PI and run Thompson sampling. And given that you've done a lot of work on that, um, like what's your sense of when that's a good idea versus when, like using robust estimate yeah. is a good idea? So when you have lots of data. Uh, then you should go robust. When you have uh, a lot of interaction or interaction potential, you should go with uh, Thompson. Uh, um, so basically, if I give you a lot of offline data and I tell you, you know, go with, try try to use that, then I don't think Thompson sampling is going to give you uh, anything uh, better. Uh, when you want, to, when re it's really online learning decisions that you care about the most, then you should probably go with uh, Thompson or. One of the one of one of its siblings. Thanks. Yeah. So I have a quick question as well. Sure. And yeah, so you're saying that the difference is it's more offline. You're just using this data and then you're being robust. So so one question is you could still introduce, uh, you know, you could uh, take a Bayesian perspective and do some uh, optimized posterior risk even in an offline setting. Um, do, you, do you, but that's probably just another approach and would perform similarly. Do you think? I think it not would not only be perform similarly. I think it would be exactly identical. Yeah. Um, so uh, what? what uh, I mean, I'm not, I, don't, I don't want to ruin the punchline of this talk, but uh, <laughs> we saw something similar like uh, to that. That uh, uh, I think that uh, the, those are all facets of the same uh, coin, and, yeah. and it's, it's they are actually you know strictly identical. Okay, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to one, how you calibrated your robust uncertainty sets, and two, why, you know, so so we have robustness in the sense that we have 
uh, upper bounds because we're looking at these uh, soups and, and uncertainty sets. But in in what sense should we think that uh, this sort of robustness in the value should lead to policies that are also robust? Okay. So uh, I'm going to give you a, a high level uh, answer. I think to get to the details will require probably most of the rest of the time that I have. Uh, but on, on the high level, uh, robustness uh, offers you a form of uh, generalization. So uh, um, if you want to generalize, uh, um, I think those are the, the two concepts are, are while well, they seem uh, perhaps opposing in some sense, uh, they are quite uh, quite equivalent. So if you build robustness into your, into the value function, it's going to give you a, a policy which is going to generalize well. Okay, so, uh, thank you. Um, uh, um, so, so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about uh, risk-sensitive uh, uh, policy gradient. And um, I'll especially talk about the conditional value at risk uh, that is uh, a, known, uh, a known risk measure. So this is uh, just uh, to remind you so, and to fix notations. So the conditional value at risk, so you have a random variable x. There is a quantile alpha, when alpha is, say, 5% or 10%. And uh, alpha conditional value at risk um, or, or shortfall is just a conditional expectation given that uh, X is in the lower alpha quantile. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, of course, sensitive to rare disastrous events, very common, commonly used. And, and estimating it is really easy, right? Estimating uh, uh, the expectation is, say, the empirical mean. So estimate, estimating uh, the alpha, uh, the CVAR alpha CVAR, instead of, uh, of dividing by, by the number of samples, you divide by alpha the, uh, times the number of samples, and instead of uh, taking the uh, average of uh, all samples, just the alpha, alpha and word sample. So uh, CVAR is fairly easy. And then uh, um, um, uh, what you're going to talk about is uh, about policy optimization. So the policy is encoded by parameters. Uh, this is what people do in all practical fields of uh, RL, robotics grades, everything usually by a deep network. So there are uh, parameters, that those parameters uh, affect the stochastic system, uh, the dynamics, uh, because the, the, those are the policy parameters, and also uh, uh, the payoff. So uh, in the standard objective is just to maximize the expected return. A risk-sensitive objective instead just replaces the expected return with, uh, uh, in this uh, in our case, uh, the CVAR, but there are other, other uh, risk-sensitive uh, ob risk objectives you can think of, of like maximizing the expected return subject to CVAR bigger than something or, 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 uh, or, 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 or things of this nature. So uh, in previous work uh, that was done mostly in uh, operation research, uh, people consider more of a portfolio optimization type where uh, a, a specific player does not affect uh, the choice of the portfolio doesn't, is assumed to not affect the market. Uh, because the player is small enough and so forth. It only affects the payoff function. But uh, um, in, as from an, an engineering perspective, uh, the policy itself, the parameters of the policy uh, um, do affect the system dynamics uh, itself. So uh, um, um, just to overview our approach, uh, we're going to, to, uh, sh to offer a new uh, gradient uh, Formula for the uh, a new formula for the gradient of um, of the uh, uh, CVAR, um, and then of course a sampling based uh, based uh, estimator. The update of the parameter itself is going to be nothing to write home about. It's just a standard uh, 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 stochastic gradient descent. So let's go to the basics a little bit. So this is a likelihood uh, ratio uh, method, also known as um, policy gradient. Uh, so how do you estimate uh, the gradient of the expected return? You uh, just write the gradient, uh, you, you push uh, the gradient in, divide and multiply by f of x, and here you have the expectation of, uh, of the gradient of, uh, over f of x uh, given x, and so now um, you can sample from this expectation of a given policy, and this uh, uh, trick here is just uh, um, uh, to look at the uh, gradient of the log of the, of the, of the, um, of the PDF of, uh, of x. So this, I think, is it's something fairly well known. It's known as the policy gradient theorem or uh, the likelihood ratio method. I think uh, uh, this is something that is taught in simulation classes. Okay, so what about the CVAR? So we see that uh, to estimate uh, the, the, uh, the gradient of the expectation, we need just, we can just average uh, the, uh, the N uh, uh, gradient of, uh, of the log of uh, each, each sample. 
So maybe we could just take the alpha and worst samples and, and be done with it, uh, do the same thing exactly. And, and this is, would not work. And the reason is, uh, is Leibniz's uh, integral law. So now is a flashback to calculus uh, one or two, I guess. Um, so the, the gradient of the integral from minus infinity to Q of a function um, has, uh, uh, has two terms. There is one term, which is the, is the usual term, in, integral from minus infinity to Q, but there is also a correction term that, uh, that, is, that is determined according to the dependence of Q in the parameters. So the dependence of the quantile uh, itself, because if, if the quantile itself also depends on, on, the, on theta, the, the, the policy parameters, then we have to take that into, into account. So uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, this leads to the following uh, uh, result. Uh, so the gradient of the CVAR of any random variable is the expectation of the likelihood ratio. Uh, that's the same as uh, we have for expected return. But you have to deduct from that uh, uh, Q, the quantile, the true quantile at uh, theta. Of course, everything is conditional on return less than, uh, less than uh, uh, Q. So, so this is a, um, a formula that comes from uh, uh, first principles. But then, of course, we don't have access to the actual quantile, which you can only have access to the empirical quantile. Uh, so we can approximate uh, um, over the alpha and worst samples of this likelihood ratio. Uh, and here we have minus the empirical quantile. Uh, and the algorithm, so the algorithm that you're going to get is pretty simple. You draw and an samples. You estimate the empirical quantile. Uh, you sort uh, the returns. You select the alpha n worth uh, element. You substitute in the estimation algorithm, and and, and that's it. That that's really the algorithm. So so what we see here is that in, if you had a, a standard policy gradient, then all that you would you you would you'd probably you'd not be able you you just uh, uh, would estimate things uh, regularly, and uh, you don't have to estimate the empirical uh, uh, quantile. So let's see what what gives here in terms of uh, um, in terms of uh, you know applications um, maybe quote unquote here. Uh, so we we'll look here at uh, at softmax uh, uh, policy. This is a Tetris, and we compare in red standard policy gradient and in blue uh, this uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent based on uh, on C bar. So let's see the histogram of of results. So the standard policy gradient is in red, and the, the CVAR policy gradient is in blue. Larger score is better. Okay, so uh, uh, obviously the, the, the red looks, uh, looks better on expectation, and indeed the average reward is, is much higher. Also note that the quantile is higher. So the, the alpha quantile of, of the standard policy gradient is higher. Uh, but what happens to the CVAR? The CVAR is, uh, uh, is lower uh, uh, for the... Uh, standard policy gradient uh, compared to the uh, to the CVAR uh, grant, which is what we, we looked, uh, uh, what, what you expect to happen. And you see the result here. So those are the really low scores. Those are the scores that would embarrass you if you ever play, play Tetris. Um, so we see that uh, in those the area here, which is very low probability, but still non-negligible one, uh, the standard policy grant just go there much more often, while the, the, um, while the, the CVAR policy grant uh, is much, much lower there. So so what we see here is that if you care about uh, low, uh, low, uh, not not getting embarrassed when you play uh, when you play uh, Tetris uh, with your with your, with your kids, and this is a, a good way uh, a good way to do that. Okay. So uh, uh, um, in the interest of uh, of time, I'm going to skip uh, uh, other risk measures, and I want to tell you a little bit about uh, something which is uh, I mean you should, I saw you I, I showed you showed you this picture before. That risk awareness uh, implies uh, robust uh, uh, robust policies, and then I sort of hand waved my my way around it. So so let's try to be a little bit more uh, more precise here. So uh, it turns out that uh, the conditional value at risk um, and moral uncertainty are precisely equivalent, and I want to define uh, um, a particular type of uncertainty set, which is uh, um, what's written here. So. Um, I'm looking at the multiplicative perturbation, so the the the, the, the perturbation uh, of uh, at st plus one, there is some nominal value, and then there is some uh, budget for the uncertainty. So, and this budget had this property that uh, the, the product of this budget is less than some parameter uh, eta. So this is means basically the worst cannot happen at every time. If I have uh, if I deviate a lot from um, 
uh, from my nominal uh, my nominal value, then I have to sort of compensate by not deviating a lot in other other places. So this defined a kind of a weird uncertainty set, which you know has some uncertainty budget. Of course, note that if eta equals one, then there is nothing I could do. I have to be precisely at the, at the right uh, at, the expect, at the at the right value. Uh, so mean that I'm always at nominal. So when eta is, is if eta is very large, then I can deviate in many uh, in many places. So the whole idea that the, the worst cannot happen uh, at every time. So so the theorem and the result here that um, uh, that if you if you want to solve uh, C var at one over eta, so a conditional value at risk at uh, with a percentile of one over eta. Think about eta as say you know. 10, so it's going to be 10% uh, worse uh, CVAR, then this is precisely the same as, uh, as solving the robust optimization problem or the robust MDP, where your disturbance belong to this uh, um, uh, perturbation set of multiplicative, uh, multiplicative uh, um, uh, uncertainty. Now, now, I think this is a result should, should sink into a little bit because it has a very profound meaning. It means that whether you want to optimize a CVAR or you want to do this uh, robustness thing, you're doing the same thing. You're just calling it by, that, by different names. And in fact, it is our belief that um, um, every robust optimization problem uh, of a certain class, um, again, there are some technical literature here, here uh, is equivalent to some risk measure. And every, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details here, every co co convex coherent, um, I'm, again, if you don't know what it is, then I'm, I'm not going to explain it in the, the next uh, next few minutes. Uh, risk measure is equivalent to a robust optimization problem. And what you want to solve, that's up to you. That's, that's a, a, a computational question. It's not a, a modeling question uh, at this point. So uh, um, uh, if there are any questions, I think now though would be a, a good time. Before I'm going to tell you about some more uh, recent uh, uh, recent uh, recent works that try to take this idea of, of robustness uh, into, uh, into in, in, more into practice. So we have one question from Shane. Yeah, Hi, Shane. yeah. Thanks, David. Um, so I was just curious about that particular form of uncertainty set. It looks very very strong um, because if I'm reading this correctly, it's for all possible sample parts, all possible actions, this product has to lie below eta. Right, but, but no, 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 I mean, it's it's definitely true uh, that it's, it's a strong form, but note that eta is a multiplicative uh, uh, element. So eta multi multiplies this nominal value, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and that's basically uh, what we're seeing here, that uh, the, this, and, and think about if you're, if you look at 5%, then eta is say 20. So this is a, a product set, and you know that's it. I mean, this is this is a result. I don't have anything else to say, but I know how to prove it. <laughs> Fair enough. I have a question. If we have time, sure. Um, the question is uh, from a from a practical point of view, how would you, you know? So if I think about this as a as a as a convex coherent risk measure, um, like how do I think about the risk measure that I choose, you know, or or alternately, how do I think about the the set of models that I do my worst case over? Do, do you have any advice about that? Um, so I think I think it's a it's a it's a fairly complex question, um, and um, uh, to to be honest. Uh, I don't have uh, an advice before, you know, beyond uh, uh, do what works or what you have to do. Uh, with uh, with uh, CVAR, say, which is, a, I think, of, I mean, a risk measure that we understand uh, fairly well, there's also the question of the quantiles. So how do you choose 5% or 10% or 2%? I mean, what is uh, the value that you you actually, uh, you actually uh, want to do? So there is a whole uh, um, subculture of... Uh, of uh, trying to find uh, uh, the correct risk measures uh, and how to um, ta ta tailor them for uh, particular tasks uh, at hand. Some of them, uh, I mean, if you look at the exponential um, risk measures, so this is, uh, you look at trying to optimize e to the power of minus uh, lambda times the cumulative return, uh, expected of that, expectation of that, of course. So this lambda uh, determines your risk attitude. 
uh, and uh, and and you know it can be positive, it can be negative. It's going to determine the result. And there's the whole question of how do you how do you do that? So 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 the short answer to your question is that I don't know. Um, you know that's a question for for, for for you know maybe people that are more more applied than I am. But all I can tell you that if you're going to choose between a, a particular different values of CVAR, you're not going to get dramatically uh, different uh, different uh, answers. Uh, and you can see that from what, what's written here, right? I mean, if this is your uncertainty set, if you mod modify eta from, you know, zero point from uh, from ten to ten point two, then probably not going to make a, a big difference. So you have continuity, uh, at least for uh, for co co convex coherent risk measure, you have some continuity. And choosing the right one, it's really a, a design choice or a regulation choice. Uh, in in power grids, for example, it's going to be regulation. So in power grids, uh, uh, you're talking about something like how many hours in a year uh, your grid is going to be uh, your grid, your grid is going to be off. So uh, this is going to determine uh, that you're going to probably look at CVAR, and then uh, um, you know if, if you live in any place but Texas, then it's probably going to work out well for you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, if, could I ask one more question before sure. you go on? Um, in in this um, exp um, well, when when one uses likelihood ratio gradient estimators, <clears throat> a notorious problem is uh, variance of the gradient estimate, mm -hmm. and that's particularly uh, a problem when you take these kinds of products of many many terms. Is right. your uncertainty set um, going to have the impact, um, sort of a happy impact? Of bounding the variance of that likelihood ratio estimator as well, uh, reducing, not bounding, uh, uh, but yes, uh, it's going to reduce uh, the variance, and that's uh, one of the boons of uh, of the approach. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, um, Nathan, how, how, am I, how am I doing on time? Uh, so we have seven more minutes. I know a lot of people have to leave uh, on the hour. Okay. Um, so just FYI, and if you want to leave time for questions at the end, or if you want to make sure to get to your take-home messages. Sure. So I'm going to, to, to talk just about one of the, of the works, uh, more recent work, and I want to, uh, this is a, um, a practical way to do action robustness. So, so this is a, what you call a trembling hand model. So uh, you want to choose policy, or you think you choose going to choose policy pi, but in fact, with, you're going to get pi with high probability, one minus alpha, but with a small probability alpha, you're going to get something else, like some, some, something that is even adversarial. So you can think about like your hand is sort of trembling and with high probability, you're doing what you should do. And then with a small probability, something else is, uh, is happened. So this leads to what you call uh, um, action robust um, uh, DDPG. Um, um, DDPG is for differential uh, policy gradient. Um, so this is a process that has, uh, you find the optimal policy. And then uh, you, there is an adversary that is going to, uh, with, with small probability, but it's going to be uh, do the worst possible thing against you. You have out the Jones policy. So this is the mixed policy that with high probability chooses what you want and with low probability chooses what the adversary wants. And then you go uh, in a loop like that. So now you have a, 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 an, an optimal actor policy, an optimal adversary policy, and you value them. And then you, you loop uh, all the way, uh, essentially add uh, infinitum. Uh, so, so this is just to give you an idea of how that, can, what can, 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 can happen here. So uh, uh, this is, uh, so the baseline is uh, in blue. And, and here we, we have a, a problem that you, we change the relative mass. This is a, 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 a balancing problem, it's a full balancing problem. And, and what we see here is that uh, um, not only that you get better performance, uh, the, the performance here, this is the noise probability. And, um, and this is a, uh, uh, the relative mass. So the relative mass here is one. Uh, as you make the problem more and more difficult, uh, you get a better uh, generalization, not only for the problem that you want to solve, but also for the original problem. So also for the problem where there is no uh, where, where there is no uh, uh, noise. So what we get here is that I mean we can do the whole the whole loop there. Everything works here. Uh, we do it with deep learning. There is a uh, an underlying uh, very complex uh, uh, deep learning algorithm, but but the, the crux of the matter here is that um, um, that uh, you get uh, uh, an algorithm that works uh, not only for your problem but also works better for other uh, other problems. Uh, so I'm going to skip this one, uh, and um, I just want to my take home message. So so one take home message is basically 
uh, you should solve robust risks and uncertainty of MDPs. I mean, they're just a better way to handle uncertainty. Uh, they're scalable, they work, and they have lots of applications. And uh, and and if you if you ask me what is like the big question here that is remained is how to how to to how to formulate uh, regularization and generalization uh, in in in, in re reinforcement uh, uh, learning in general. Um, this is something I've worked on for many years, and I, I think I feel that right that right now I'm I'm about to solve it. Like this is risk and robustness is, is a solution. Uh, uh, to make uh, RL algorithm uh, uh, generalized. And, and the, the form of risk and, 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 uh, and robustness may be different than what we initially thought, but uh, this is what makes algorithm work. Uh, uh, the, 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 the being able to be robust is uh, another coin for uh, another, uh, the facet, another facet of uh, regularization and generalization. And just to, to sort of, you know, the classical, if you want to think about what is uh, reinforcement learning, then uh, in the like in the last few years, we focused on algorithms. This has been the focus of the community. Um, that was great, but that was then. Now we should focus on on other things, on on the data, on the representation, and on the five uh, principles that I mentioned before: the awareness, accountability, adaptivity, lifecycle consciousness, and and scal uh, scalability. And just my personal notes from working on uh, some autonomy uh, problem, we're very far from full autonomy. I don't know how many years, uh, and uh, but we're very, very far. And uh, because our RL work works best when you have other environment which is very stochastic or that you have a, a superb uh, simulator. And when you do a lot of control actions, um, like in the stock market uh, and in other uh, maybe computer networks, but but you know the real world is neither. It's not highly stochastic, and you don't have a simulator. You have a, a lot of agents uh, that are, that are interacting. And uh, and and really, by the way, one one key lesson that I'm just mentioned here is that uh, uh, the key is applications, uh, and the lesson that we learn uh, uh, from them. An application here is something that something is somebody is willing to pay money for. Uh, so this is what an application uh, an application is, and I think uh, RL is uh, coming of uh, of age now. And uh, there are lots of uh, lots of exciting things that are happening. So with that, I will conclude. Uh, thank you for your time. So we have, uh, you know, just a couple of minutes for more questions. And if people have to go, uh, please feel free to go. I I want to start with just one question that maybe uh, you know it fits the the open ended theme you, you ended on, which is. So you focused on the importance of robustness in these applications. And one of the examples you gave earlier for model robustness was this put option uh, example. It, but in a lot of these applications you mentioned in the beginning, like in medicine and in autonomous driving, we just assume it's an MDP, but maybe like the big model uncertainty is even, whether it's even Markovian, whether we have the features that kind of factor the future from the past. I mean, I was wondering if, you know, I mean, that's a super hard problem, obviously, but if you have something to say about kind of robustness to that, you know, inerrant assumption we're making whenever we're doing MVPs. Yeah, so this is uh, obviously an issue for uh, not just for medicine, also for uh, autonomous driving, for anything that involves uh, uh, complex uh, agents uh, around you. Um, the, the easy way or the easy way out is to try to make it an MDP. So, you know, everything is an MDP with enough history. Uh, all right. So, so this is what people are trying to do in autonomous driving. In medicine, they're probably not, not going to have enough, uh, enough data uh, for almost all problems. So, so, so I think that, uh, uh, I mean, there are works uh, trying to make a robust MDPs. I think they're just trying to make a very hard problem even harder. Uh, and uh, at least, uh, at least for me, the solution is to look at predictive models. So you should have a predictive forward model that are fairly strong. And uh, if you do that, then uh, you can derive a policy which uh, is probably going to be pretty good. And and of course, uh, the, the counterfactual element is is obvious. This is something that uh, uh, we don't know how to deal with at this point in time. So I have plenty more questions on that, but we can talk about that later in yeah. that meeting. Uh, do other people have? Uh, questions. Yeah, Shane. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Um, so, um, I was curious about uh, your your statement that CVAR is, in some sense, equivalent to robustness. So, it's equivalent to robustness for this particular uncertainty set, and there is this nice duality associated with convex risk measures. 
does that mean that any convex risk measure, coherent convex risk measure would have an equivalent uncertainty set representation? I believe so, yes. Is it a theorem or is it a belief? Yes. No, it's a theorem. <laughs> it's a theorem. Uh, it's, but called are, the, uh, it's called the finchel moreau theorem. Yeah, but, but there are caveats here. So there are, there are, there are fine, fine letters that uh, one has to read carefully, but the short answer is yes. Thank you. Yeah, here I had a question here. Um, so <clears throat> I really like your last punchline application, something, right? That should be the focus. Um, now, a lot of algorithm part, uh, the deep learning uh, played uh, uh, key roles in the success of uh, various algorithms. Um, so as the complexity that, right, today's talk, you see the real world problem is a lot more complex, the problem formulation, representation, et cetera. So, how um, is the, where the model will be, because the problem is more difficult, it will more, model will be simpler. So how uh, the deep learning play a role there in this, uh, uh, what do you perceive in this real uh, world applications that uh, are extremely complex? So, uh, I mean, at least for uh, uh, both for self-driving, but also for, uh, uh, other applications, uh, deep learning is playing a pivotal role in, in the forward models. So I don't think anyone will do end-to-end -end, uh, driving with, uh, with deep learning. I mean, nobody that I know of, at least. But what people are considering uh, seriously uh, is, or, or, or at least as far as I know, of course, uh, is that uh, uh, the forward models, the prediction models of how other agents are going to react and uh, the dynamics, uh, they're going to be uh, um, driven by deep learning. So, so, so in some sense, uh, uh, the inputs to, your, to the control model are going to come from deep learning. The control model themselves, I mean, probably not. They're probably not going to be deep learning based uh, because uh, I think that uh, the, you need very high fidelity and, and at least for mission critical applications, uh, the, the time is not ripe for uh, for deep learning uh, applications. Thanks. Okay, so now, oh, okay. And Sid, another question? If you follow up on, I think this was sort of what um, Nathan was also asking. So in all of these models, when you're saying that the robust formulation is equivalent to a, a Bayesian formulation, do you have a sense of like what is the prior which induces the robust formulation? Or is there some general notion of if I give you a setting, this is the prior which leads to the robust? Yes, so so in some, uh, first I think I think uh, the question is not, is not easy to answer, uh, uh, but in some setting uh, you can do that. So for example, uh, you, can, you can show that uh, UCB, which is um, uh, the robust equivalent of, uh, of uh, a bandit problem and, and Thompson sampling are in some sense equivalent. So, yeah, so, and again, you can, we can argue whether the sense is precise or not, but this is a, uh, you know, for, 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 for some, most people would say they're, they're the same, even though they're, they're minor, like the equivalence is not, is not strict. Uh, uh, it, usually uh, when you look at the, uh, when you have a, a prior, then the prior can uh, be reflected in uh, what's known as a distributionally robust uh, uh, problem. So in distributional robustness, then you look at all probability measures of, of uh, the, and, and the worst case probability measure over uncertainty sets. And, uh, and that's, that's something that is pretty precise. So this is something that you can show that there is a, actually a strict equivalent between distributional robustness and some Bayesian optimization uh, uh, problem. It doesn't mean that one is easier than the other. Both are pretty difficult to solve uh, uh, numerically or algorithmically. Uh, so there is an equivalence. Um, usually the Bayesian, if you have a very strong Bayesian prior, then uh, you should use it. Uh, so the rule of thumb is that, uh, you know, if you know what, what, is, what is your problem and you should try to solve the problem you want to solve, you really want, want to solve. Uh, but, uh, but often this is a much, much much uh, uh, easier said than done, and and we use a flat prior, and flat prior is just not informative, so it basically g gives you a, a sort of a, a, a bland, uh, robust optimization problem, which is not too interesting in the same way that the Bayesian approach would be non-interested, non-interesting. So, so what I'm trying to say is that um, 
the in, in the flat case everything is the same, and then in the non-flat case things become uh, interesting. I see. So maybe the way I was sort of thinking about it is, it feels like it would be interesting to know when the flat prior is actually equivalent to this sort of a robust prior. Like what is like what's the structure of the MDP, which under which sort of an uninformative prior is actually the hardest one to solve under versus are there actually MDPs where like the robust prior is more is stranger than the flat prior in some sense? Um, um, I don't know. Yeah, if that, 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 I think I understand what we're asking. It's, it's, it's a good question. I said flat priors are not useful. Flat priors are, I mean, they, they, you have no information, so you don't, shouldn't expect to gain anything uh, uh, from it. Could I, I ask? I think I'm talking to you next, so yeah, I should hold up. Feel free to uh, say that we should talk about this offline, but uh, I'm, I'm sort of curious about um, exactly how tractable these uh, these optimizations are when you're using these gradient estimators based on likelihood ratios. So um, my experience with working with them with any kind of complex model where you have many random variables and therefore the likelihood is a product um, is that they're super high variance so that the, um, you know, the, the gradient ends up being, the gradient estimate just being, ends up being so noisy that it's very difficult to actually use to find a, a decent direction. Um, what's your experience been? So I think the answer is, is, is you know, it depends. Uh, so uh, the, the, the issue that, uh, I think that nowadays you expect to run problems for uh, billions with a B of samples. Um, so the compute power has grown, uh, I mean, so much that, uh, uh, you expect to just simulate the heck out, out of any, any problem. And while there is a lot of variance, we, there are techniques for variance reduction that work quite well. And the opt optimizers, I mean, yeah, Adam or other opt optimizers are quite good. So while there is a lot of variance, we sort of handle it by different uh, tricks and uh, of the, uh, the deep learning people are you know, very proficient in. So I think this is, a, at least for the application that I've seen, I think this is a problem which is a, surmountable. So I, I can appreciate your point about sample sizes being potentially huge, but billions with a B will disappear pretty quickly when you have product with a P of, you know, these these uh, likelihood ratio terms where um, each one is kind of super variable. Um, yeah, by the way, one thing is you should notice that, that I think what now, now what more, most people do is listen to RL that uh, uh, we don't have a very long, we don't have very long trajectories. So our uh, trajectories have, are are not typically, you know, not thousands of samples. Uh, typically, you, you you have a scenario, and this scenario is going to be maybe a hundred samples, probably even less, and then you're going to run it a gazillion times. So, I don't. I think that uh, I mean, this is a pro of course a, a problem, but it's not different than other problems in in deep learning where you have lots of variability and noise from you know God knows uh, what reason. So. Uh, I think that uh, um, at least with when people run with uh, scenarios, I think it's fairly fairly manageable. Just think about a self-driving car, right? I mean, most of the time it's really not interesting what what is happening when you're driving, right? I mean, nothing happens. Uh, so you you want to focus on the on that you know fraction of a fraction of of the times where uh, you actually need uh, attention, because most of the time, basically, you know, the rule is just to go forward and you know stay in lane. Uh, so I think that the trajectories are pretty, usually pretty short. Great. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the, the truncation of the run length is a common trick for mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So I think now is a good time to wrap up. And I'm sure there's going to be lots more questions for uh, uh, Shai in the meetings. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming. And thanks Shai so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, and see you in, in uh, our meeting. Okay. Thank you. Bye. See you guys.